Good day, welcome. I am Marcel Feil and the moderator for the series of Artists in Conversation. This is a series of broadcasts by Dutch Culture, through which we learn more about the cultural climate in several countries by offering artists the opportunity to go into conversation with each other. Every edition of the series consists of a dialogue between an artist from the Netherlands and an artist from another country. Through mutual interests and sharing experiences and observations, we get to know not only the artists and their practices, but also the cultural sector of a certain country, the environment that they work in and how this influences their practice. Today, we will dive deeper into the artistic dialogue between the Netherlands and Indonesia. And we have invited artists from both countries. Our guests for today are Ayu Atumi, who will tell us about the state of the culture in Indonesia in a brief speech, and photographers Joshua Irwandi and Geert van Kesteren. With them, we will talk about their interests and professional experiences. But first, Ayu Atumi. Ayu received the 2000 Prince Klaus Awards and the 2018 Ahmed Bakri Award for Literature. During Indonesia's military regime, she was a journalist and an activist for freedom of the press. She was one of the founders of the Alliance of Independent Journalists. Her first novel, Saman, became a beacon of freedom during the movement for political change in Indonesia. Ayu, welcome. It's great that you could join us from Indonesia. Um, as said in my brief introduction, you have prepared a short text to shed a light on the current state of arts and culture in Indonesia. It's not easy to deliver uh, a view on this in only, say, seven minutes, but may I invite you to deliver and share this speech with us. Ayu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marcel. Good day, everybody. Goedemiddag. Salam. I want to start with a word in Indonesia that some of you may have known, Gotong Royong. Gotong Royong is a very special expression that most Indonesians will understand. It means doing things together or more precisely building good things together. The word Gotong Royong originated from the Japanese language, despite that the root of Indonesian language is Malay. It entered into the foundational narration of the nation of Indonesia thanks to Sukarno, Indonesia's first president. In fact, he said it ha if he has to extract the Pancasila or our five pillars of Indonesia into only three pillars, it would be socio-nationalism, socio-democracy, and the belief in God. I know it may sound rather scary from some Dutch, but he said again, if he had to extract again this three into one, he said it would be Gotong Royong. So Gotong Royong is, in other words, the base of the base, the extraction of Indonesia in one expression. But uh, can you sense what is special with this one word formula compared to the formula of three or even formula of five, the Pancasila? This formula one doesn't have any content. It is not about any content. It is about a mechan mechanism. When we say words like social nationalism, social democracy, belief in God, we understand their content, the values and ideology contained in the concepts. But when we say Gotong Royong or building things together, it is not about any content value. It is about a mechanism. Sukarno must have sensed that this mechanism works beyond identity or ideology. Means whether you are a religious person, a communist, a nationalist, or a simple person, we can build things together. The rest, we can find ways to negotiate later on. Building things together is a mechanism regardless of 
your values or ideology. Now, in these two difficult years of the global COVID-19 pandemic, Gotong Royong is again what most Indonesians opt for. No exception is the artists or culture workers. In the first month of the pandemic outbreak, the government was faced with two choices, to implement a total lockdown or to find another way. The government found another way. It chose to apply social distancing regulation that will be reviewed periodic periodically and combined with other policies and social support instruments. It even targeted low-income art and culture workers with some social support, even though the distribution didn't always reach its targets. There were also different kinds of support for cultural activities. Artists and culture workers were also given priority for receiving vaccines, probably considering that they will help the government with the vaccine campaign. But despite the lack of effectiveness of the local bureaucracy, the government managed to communicate its goodwill and build trust. And trust is the basic of Gotong Royong. With trust in the air, the art and culture workers work together to build support among each other. So for example, in the first year of the pandemic, Studio DSS Music produced virtual concerts with musicians playing from different rooms or places called Concert to Juruang or Seven Spaces Concert. Salihara Art Space recreated the documentation of its previous performances into new online shows. Festivals were held online, and there were also several solidarity efforts like Friends Helping Friends Among Writers in which more prominent writers held book sales and donate to the less lucky writers. I cannot say that all the efforts are successful. Perhaps none of the Gotong Royong ad hoc innovation have given satisfactory results. But I think to prolong the trust is to prolong our breath in order that we can survive the waves of the pandemic. The pandemic has somehow reduced the social and political tension powered by religious sentiment that had built up in the previous years and had gained momentum in 2016 with the 22, uh, 22 or 212 demonstration against the Chinese Christian Jakarta governor Ahok. We know the story. Ahok was libelled with blasphemy and through a highly pressured court process, he was sentenced to jail. The 212 movement is regarded by its proponents as a victory of the Islamic movement, but not all Indonesian Muslims agreed with it. Here, I want to go back to the time of the establishment of Indonesia in the 40s. Already when Sukarno reformulated the five foundational pillars of Indonesia, the Pancasila, this new nation had already faced tensions between option one, that is for a religious identity, and option two, a national identity. We know the story. In the history of Indonesia, the second option prevailed so far with inspirations of the first option, looming and reappearing from time to time. And trend in literature and films can also show this. When I wrote my first novel, Saman, like 20 something years ago, it was apparently the end of the military regime without us knowing it. But the atmosphere at that time was a revulsion to authoritarianism. Readers craved for freedom welcomed the novel enthusiastically because it was regarded to have spoken about politics, religion, and sexuality openly, critically, and in a new way. It became a bestseller, followed by publishers seeking new young writers who wrote freely regarding politics, religion, and sexuality. The beginning of 2000 was the euphoria of LGBT novels and the spring of the Q Film Festival. 
But within seven years, the trend of liberty was taken over by another trend, namely religiosity and new conservatism. Islamic novels gain a huge readership. Ayat Ayat Cinta or Verses of Love, a novel by Habibur Rahman El Shirazi, epitomized the trend both in the book and film industry. In conjunction with this were political efforts to apply Sharia-inspired law, such as the Anti-Pornography and Porno Action Bill, and several local regulations relating dress code, gender, and alcohol. Not to mention the rise of power of the certain paramilitary groups like the Islamic Defender Front. If we are allowed to group these trends as one, then this trend that used religious sentiment culminated in the imprisonment of Ahok, the Chinese governor of Jakarta. This trend seems to have quite set down during the pandemic. We cannot say that it is because of the pandemic. There are many variables of causes and the outcome is yet to come. However, we can sneak a peek into the trend in literature and film. There has no groundbreaking new novel, film, or trend within the last five years, I think. However, in the overall, religious trend has descended and more critical views on religion expressed in literature, like Febi Indirani's short story collection, Bukan Perawan Maria, or Not the Virgin Mary, or Ahda Imran poetry book, Lidah Orang Suci, or The Saint's Tongue. In films, produced during the pandemic, we also see more stories questioning conventional and conservative morality. Many of the writers, artists, and culture workers involved in the production of this were involved in the Gotong Rayong, the building of support and solidarity together during the pandemic. Again, when Sukarno formulated Gotong Royong, I assumed if he hadn't, even if he hadn't, he didn't write it explicitly, he must have sensed that the word Gotong Royong is about the mechanism of living together and not about identity and ideology. Sometimes the mechanism can be more important than the content. It is not a formal procedural mechanism like a formal procedural democracy, it is the mechanism that will generate its value on living together. And I am op optimistic about Indonesia. Thank you. It was quite revealing for us also to learn more about your ideas about the current state of culture in Indonesia, especially within the framework of the Kotorayong um, way of, of living. It was a, a concept not that familiar with me, but perhaps we can also invite Josh and Geert to uh, to share their ideas. And perhaps, Josh, would you be able to give a first reaction upon Ayu's words and especially the the concept of Kotoroyong? I think um, Ayu addressed that um, very clearly and very quite and very strikingly. Um, and that, that's that's a culmination and a, like a, a, a real good summary of, what, of of what's happening here in Indonesia. I mean, my most uh, recent memory would be uh, during COVID, um, especially in in June and July of this year, when when the nation, um, you know, suffered from from the de from the Delta uh, variant of the virus. Um, uh, well, Gotong Royong was was all part of it. Uh, that 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 kept the community together um despite of 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 desperation and yes and and, and indeed um like i you said um in within the arts and culture uh community um artists um, towards each other try to be supportive um anga sasongo for example a filmmaker um made an initiative that that supports the filmmakers around indonesia um, to be able to continue make films um and all that I think uh, I use some um, summed it up um, very well. Geert, you're, you're familiar with Indonesia as well uh, in various ways. One of the things I heard Ayu saying was that also, perhaps due to the pandemic, also religious trends seem to be descending. Is this something that you recognize? 
Yes, it's something you, 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 you see during crisis, but also I think in the past 10 years that the, the, the rise of um, uh, religious nationalism, um, uh, yeah, it, it's rising not only in Indonesia, but in, in many, many states around the world, uh, Islamic states. And that there is, if there is a solidarity mechanism, as uh, got on in Indonesia, that's beyond religion and politics, I, and that can unite people uh, be, beyond all that, I think uh, that that's lovely and, and really essential to do so. Especially today, where uh, on top of uh, all the the, the, the religious uh, politics, uh, where we also have these crazy uh, conspiracy theories uh, going over the internet. Mm -hmm. Ayu, um, how would it be possible, if at all, to keep up this momentum of descending religious trends and more solidarity, not only between artists and uh, within the cultural field, but perhaps more in general? Would there be ways to keep up with this slightly more positive dynamics also after the pandemic? Yeah, uh, it's also a question for us, but I think uh, many people is using uh, many people are using this situation in which uh, uh, this new situation, the new normal, and the uh, limited uh, uh, social distancing. Yeah, like uh, we 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 know that in the past, schools have been places where uh, where teachers shared the intolerance views as uh, state schools mm -hmm. um, probably it is it is a kind of blessing because now students don't go to schools because of the uh, social distancing they are uh, they work from home and the proliferation of intolerant ideas also reducing so uh, yeah we still have to use this um, this condition which is for me is a positive condition for for the uh, solidarity and tolerance and we wait for what happens after the pandemic and because Indonesia we also uh, will also uh, have a uh, political events again and that's always every time we will have election then these issues of uh, religious sentiments will be used but I'm still optimistic. You share this optimism, Josh? Um, I do. Um, well, I try. Um, uh, well, I mean, that, that's, I mean that, that's, of course, that's the reality in Indonesia. But then, of, and yes, uh, we, we just have to, you know, move forward. And, um, you know, they're, they're just the concept of, of Gautama Rayong itself. You know, it's um, it's it's for for people coming together, and 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 you know, there is just like, and there is optimism in there for for people not to you know fall out into, um, you know, uh, populism in, in 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 the country, so to speak. Yeah, quite clear. Thank you, Ayu Utami, again for your wonderful delivery of a wonderful speech. I think again quite revealing, and. Uh, Hopefully, we will see you later on. Uh, but for now, thank you for your contribution. The, the time forces us to continue with our program. Thanks again on behalf of Dutch Culture for your contribution. Thank Thank you. <laughs> and we we'll continue with our two photographers slash filmmakers, because Geert van Kerstre has developed it himself into a filmmaker more and more. But first, we continue with Joshua Irvandi, who is a documentary photographer represented by uh, Seven Photo Agency um, and also a National Geographic Explorer based in Jakarta, Indonesia. While working in West Papua, Indonesia, you were embedded at, as museum staff and at the Asmat Museum. Perhaps we can speak later on uh, about the project Not a Blank Canvas, which was awarded the National Geographic Society Storytelling Grant in 2021. Uh, Irwandi's work is also part of the Foranas Foundation Fund for Young Talent and National Geographic Society's COVID-19 Emergency Fund. And one of his images, the human cost of COVID-19, sparked controversy 
in Indonesia when it was when it went viral after publication by National Geographic. Recently, he was awarded the 2021 World Press Photo Award in General News. Um, Josh, again, welcome. Um, you have selected a single image that you thought was worthwhile to speak about a bit more in depth. Um, afterwards, we will ask Geert to join the conversation, but I want to invite you to share this one image with us and with the audience and um, share also some of the backgrounds of this particular image. George, please go ahead. All right. Um, yes, I, I've chosen this particular image uh, but because, the, you know, this was... Um, an image that I will talk later um, during my presentation, that it was the photograph of a suspected COVID-19 victim in a hospital in Indonesia uh, on the patient's deathbed waiting, awaiting a body bag. As mandated by the Indonesian Ministry of Health, um, the wrapping of the body is a standard procedure for every suspected comorbid and positive confirmed COVID-19 deaths. Um, and as is the case with most victims, family members were not allowed to say goodbye. Um, well, I chose this particular image um, because, well, th th this was the image that, um, you know, it was part of my COVID-19 coverage in Indonesia last year. Um, but more than the image, you know, my job as a, as a documentary photographer was trying to, um, uh, you know, was trying to show the reality and, 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 the, and the truth, um, as it were. Um, but then the, the significance was like when, when this image went viral and, 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 you know, it sparked controversy and people uh, were in denial about, about the existence um, um, of COVID and, 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 and they thought the photo was a setup, etc. Um, and, and, and to the larger part, it's um, also a concern um, and because in this so-called post-truth landscape, um, you know, this it, it, this image for me um, was an example of how image, how how an image, a truthful image, so to speak, a, a photojournalistic photojournalistic image, um, was, was used and decontextualized in various different ways. I wanted to show um, the work of the medical force fighting the pandemic. Um, early on, I organized food donations for the medical workers. I gained trust of the doctors and nurses, and witnessed the nature of their work. The reality for most doctors and nurses, families of patients and victims, and myself as a photojournalist that was allowed access to the hospital was vastly different to what the public might be seeing on a daily basis. As chaos, as chaos unrolled, uh, the government played down the seriousness of the spread of the virus. We simply decided to wake up late to the pandemic, the greatest medical crisis in modern, modern Indonesian history. So ahead of my coverage, I was well aware of the ethical dilemma in doing work of this nature. I was met with heavy challenge, however, when this photograph uh, was about to be published by National Geographic. The hospital was reluctant to release the image, fearing its outcome from the government and the public. So I consulted veteran foreign journalists like Hirt here, as well as academics for opinion, and they supported my case. Media lawyers, um, ensured the publication was legal. Eventually, the picture was allowed to be published with total anonymity. And the story came out. But it was when I republished the image on my personal Instagram that the photo sparked violent reactions. By posting this on social media, I wanted to highlight the human cost of coronavirus. I wanted people to know what the consequences, what the consequences might be if we ignore the health protocols. I wanted people to know what the reality was after months of statistics and adaptation to new normal. Everyone needed to know. But in an unforeseen turn of events, I became number one trending topic in Indonesia. Celebrities and government officials uh, doubted the legitimacy of the image. I was accused of setting up the photo to spread fear. Many thought I brought studio lights to photograph the body. Many thought it was a mannequin inside. I was called a slave of WHO, slave of Disney, agent of the Jews. Um, they say media is the virus, or if the photographer is still alive after two weeks, this is all pure business. And this was actually the, a, a, a post by, by National Geographic when I had to, uh, when when I asked their help to to re-verify the image by by a post on their social media account. 
Details of my private life were released as news. I received file and direct images, racial abuse, and comments across all social media. An Indonesian singer with over 2 million followers questioned the image. He said that because my post was being shared by accounts with big followers, he suspected that this image, this propaganda, uh, must have been planned. He questioned why were families not allowed to see their loved ones while a photographer was able to. He also said on, Insta on the same Instagram post that COVID exists, but it's not that scary. The Indonesian COVID-19 task force spokesperson uh, claimed that myself and the people who shared the image as being unethical, even though one of the members of his own task force team with 1.7 million followers sent me a direct message on Instagram asking for my permission to repost the image on her Instagram story. Eventually, the Indonesian government tried to hunt down and identify the hospital where the photograph was made. Consequentially, to protect the hospital and sources, uh, the rest of my images and stories from the COVID ward may never be published. To weather the storm, I request the National Geographic to re verify through the image through an Instagram post. Um, if we remember the Nat Geo's post there, um, within 21 hours, the post received over a million likes. Uh, they offered security personnel to protect my house for 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, I had to refuse that so as so as not to add fuel to the fire. So as a result of this viral activity throughout Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, uh, my initial post received over 355,000 likes, has been shared 142,000 times um, on Instagram story, and saved 30,000 times as this post insight show. This is the post insight of my, my initial um, post um, with that image. And my followers on Instagram went from 1,300 to 37.8 thousand in the space of two weeks. So this phenomenon that, that happened uh, surrounding the image is, is the basis of my project viral. Um, one image and a myriad of polarized reactions. The Project Viral um, examines the DNA of a viral image in a post Earth landscape. So we are at a point in time in history where the position of journalism as the watchdog of democracy is under grave threat. Social media is now the most substantive and effective means to bring our message. They have become indispensable. Yet we constantly, we constantly lose control of ownership our words and images too often are stolen, distorted, defamed, decontextualized. It came almost as no surprise that my image was used both as an example for those who believe and don't believe in COVID-19. We come upon a worrying fact that the only version of reality people choose to believe is the reality they curate for themselves. It's an echo chamber with no exit door. We hope to be a storyteller, recording history as it unfolds, yet how do we create narratives that best communicate realities? Who are we making pictures for? Who are really seeing our work and how are they seeing it? How does our work stand a stream of information and disinformation set out by algorithm? Above all this, how much authorship, moderation and ethics can be negotiated what, what visual history can we reference to 10, 20 years into the future? And most importantly of all, how do we restore people's faith in journalism? So these are the questions and ponderings Viral hopes to address, and this requires our deep reflection. Thank you so much, Joshua. Um, not only the picture itself was quite confronting and eerie in a way, but the way that that picture got a life and a dynamic of its own, as you just referred to, is perhaps just as troubling. Uh, Geert, before we give the floor to you, can you uh, describe the feeling when Joshua first uh, shared this image with you? Because we heard him saying that before he decided to actually publish this one picture. He did some consulting and also asked you for your opinion. What was your first initial reaction, perhaps more physical or emotional than rational? What was your first impression? 
Yeah, I think I had uh, the, the privilege of uh, being the second person to see this picture after Joshua. He sent it to me and I was looking at it and I was, I was, I was really, really uh, blown away by, by the idea that you suffer of, uh, of this disease and, and die lonely. And then they wrap you in, in a sheet and you're just all alone in, in a bed. And uh, on an emotional level, that re that really got me, and um, that it was immediately I understood it's the defining image of the pandemic. This is it. Um, the picture won the Pulitzer, it won World Press photo, but never the first prize. Which I also was part of my feeling when I saw the picture. It should have won because it is the one and only picture of the mm -hmm. pandemic. Uh, but there is so much sorrow and there is so much pain in that image. And it's so not hopeful uh, in, in that sense uh, when, you, when you speak about the Conoroyon building things together and solidarity. Because I knew um, Joshua went into the hospital to, to honor those who risk their life to save our lives, the doctors, mm -hmm. the nurses. So this hopeful message and, and um, that he wanted to show was suddenly caught in this in this image, which was yeah she, she, devastating. And I recognize very much, and this was also part of my emotion. I recognize it very much. If you are really into investigative journalism, uh, you're concentrated in, like he did on on nurses, on on doctors, and suddenly you walk in a room and you see this. And I think that's true. Uh, journalism because um, it holds those accountable accountable now they mm -hmm. have to come up with an answer um, yeah and I knew many questions would be asked uh, after this image and uh, so these were my initial feelings <laughs> thank you there, there, there will be more time for a conversation also between the two of you but I think uh, it's only right to introduce you, Geert, a little better also to an audience and also give you the possibility to introduce yourself a little bit better by also uh, showing one of your images and talking about that. But before that, um, let me introduce you in, in a few lines. Uh, of course, you're you. a photographer from the Netherlands, but currently based in Jaffa, in uh, Israel. Sorry. Um, and Geert, your photography is acclaimed for a cinematic feel of storytelling, an author with a camera that gives insight into the psyche and soul of conflict, and your landmark books, Why Mr. Why, already a while ago, First Gulf War, and Baghdad Calling about the war in Iraq. They both serve as a new model for the possibilities of engaged and innovative documentary photography. Um, it brought you various international prizes and exhibitions, such as the ICP Infinity Awards or at the Barbican Art Gallery. And your work, of course, also part of collections, such as the Rijksmuseum here in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, just as Joshua, you also picked one image um, to shed a light on and to tell more about also your work and perhaps also the life of images how images are used, abused, and got a life of their own in the turmoil of our visual reality. Please, Geert, the floor is yours for like seven minutes on that one picture. Thank you so much, Marcel. Um, yes, I, I wanted to start with a very simple image. It's, a, it's not so spectacular, but if I speak about it, maybe it will be. This is a Nokia telephone from 2005, I think showing an, uh, a, a, a picture of a friend, a friend in a hospital bed, uh, and the camera phone is being held by uh, one of his friends, uh, a doctor from Fallujah. Um, why do I show this image? I show this image because I think in 2005, six we were on the brink of a new era, um, the era of uh, uh, um, uh, mobile phone images, uh, a phenomenon that we, we, we didn't know of at the, at the time. Uh, me too, and I stumbled on it by accident. Um, I've been working as a photojournalist now for 30 years, um, and I covered the second Gulf War in Iraq uh, for Newsweek and Stern magazine, leading international magazines for many months. And after um, covering that for, I think, 10 months, I really felt like the magazines only showed uh, uh, a thin layer 
of what I experienced there and decided to publish a book. And that's the first book I, I published on the Iraq war called Why Mr. Why? Um, and Why Mr. Why was, was, was an account of uh, what, what I witnessed there. And to my surprise, uh, th that book was uh, very well received and uh, gave me a bit of international claim. Uh, and then it was time for a second uh, work on, on the war in Iraq. And by that time already, uh, millions of people had fled Iraq to uh, Syria, Turkey, uh, Jordan. And uh, unlike my time working for Newsweek, where I could travel in Iraq everywhere I wanted, more or less, um, in this time, I couldn't go back in Iraq. It was too dangerous. The sectarian and political uh, violence in Iraq was crazy. Uh, many people got killed uh, to the point that you could say it was genocide. So I met all the refugees in surrounding countries, in Damascus, uh, in, in Amman, in Jordan, etc. And I only had one question, why did you leave? And um, the, the first picture we show, um, this was a conversation I had with five doctors who left Fallujah and Baghdad and were now living in an apartment uh, in, in Amman. And on the question, why did you leave? Well, they had a, a horrible answer, like most people had, um, uh, which was that there was so much violence, they couldn't do their work anymore. One doctor was working in a hospital in Fallujah. He said, well, uh, the Americans think I work for uh, the Mujahideen, the resistance, and the uh, Mujahideen thinks I work for the Americans. Uh, many of my colleagues already have been killed. And by the way, my best friend died because of a ricocheted bullet. Uh, we couldn't treat him in our hospital. We went to the hospital in Baghdad, but the surgeon who could operate was just being abducted. So we brought him to Amman. And just before his death, we took uh, a picture and, and he died. And then he showed me that photograph on a mobile phone. And I was thinking, yeah, I cannot go to Iraq, but here on the mobile phone, I see an image um, that is so striking and, and so hurtful. Um, this, it, it, it really got me. And then I went to another Iraqi who I worked with. Uh, her name is Zainab. And I said, do you receive images from Iraq on your phone? And she said, oh, Mr. Geert, plenty. And this is where I discovered that the Iraqi refugees received mobile phone images from friends and family members in Iraq. This was three, four years before the, the um, Arab Spring. Uh, where the mobile phone was used uh, as, as a way of communication. And uh, it was, um, Facebook was just about to start. So it was something uh, we, we'd never seen. And it, I decided to collect all these images and let these images tell the story. Like, for example, this guy, because um, I think war is not only uh, death and hatred, but there's also people still living. Uh, babies are born during war, meaning there's also people make love during war as well. So it showed these images, um, what, what the people themselves thought was of importance to tell their friends and families. And I think it was important to tell us, the viewer, that story as well. In the book, uh, uh, the mobile phone, mobile phone images play a prominent, more prominent role than my own work. Uh, it's all accompanied by the stories of the refugees, uh, explaining why they left. And... Um, Today, I saw in, in, in Josh's commentary on his image that uh, the mobile phone, which is now a smartphone, um, developed so much that it became its own uh, ministry of propaganda, I, I, I would say so. And uh, so, so this rushed up into a, a phenomenon that uh, in 2005 and six and seven, not many predicted. Because when I published these images as a photojournalist, uh, it, it was a thing that was not done. Uh, you, you, you were supposed to go to a war and, and make your own pictures and not uh, uh, publish photographs that uh, were made by civilians. Of course, this has all changed now. Um, but yes, um, so a whole, uh, uh, many things have happened uh, ever since. And this is why I wanted to show this, Marcel. Yes. Quite clear. Uh, much happened afterwards, yes. um, especially uh, regarding mobile devices that can be used to make pictures, share pictures, like pictures, or give pictures a meaning that is perhaps 
completely beyond the original intentions of the original maker. Um, Joshua, can, can you briefly comment upon Baghdad Calling? What does it mean for you and what kind of influence or awareness did it have for you? Yeah, I was first introduced to Baghdad Calling um, um, by our friend Roy Filavois, a Dutch artist uh, in Amsterdam. Um, and he was he was showing both work, Why Mr. Why and Baghdad Calling. And it also showed the progression of here um, as a foreign journalist, but like why Mr. Why was, you know, image by image. Um, whereas Baghdad Calling is more not necessarily the photographer, author um, showing their work in the magazine or in a or in a book the way uh, why Mr. Why did. But it also now, um, in, you know, invites the part like a participation um, from the civilians that were represented. Um, I think that would that I think um, for me that was the most powerful um, aspect, and I think this is one of the very first photo books um, uh, to do it um, to do it this way. You know, it's 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 moving um, from the traditional, you know, front page newspaper um, kind of approach or what what photojournalists tend to do to get their work in the newspapers and magazines, but now. Um, it's also, also um, um, ha having the civilians um, uh, contribute their own realities. Yes, there, there are many very intriguing elements related to this one project that were becoming more important afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. The use of cell phone images, participatory journalism, civil journalism, but also, as you already just mentioned, um, the role of the photographer as an author, uh, authorship, morally, ethically, legally, these are all interesting things. Are these considerations also on your mind when you shot your viral image, the, the victim of the pandemic? Because you might be aware this is such a strong image, it might escape my control with all due consequences. No, I, well, to be honest, I, I, I mean, the, uh, the image was part of my, 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 of my coverage. Um, yep. And I have to be honest that it, it I, I never thought it would it would go this way. You know, it was I, I showed National Geographic a set of images and they only picked the that one image, um, mm -hmm. and that was to illustrate um, their their feature how pandemic changes. Um, that, that's the feature that we saw earlier, um, and I, w I was a um, you know I, I was a little um, I would say dis disappointed. I suppose that I couldn't I couldn't show more images, but then but then that was it was their decision, and we, you know we and 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 uh, we kind of have to 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 live with that. Um, we, you know, uh, for, might that, for might that also be a, a downside, Joshua, of such a strong iconic image that it overshadows more or less the rest, and you are remembered, or perhaps the pandemic is remembered by just a single image, while it's such a complex uh, event. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the decision go, the decision to publish that one image goes to, to, to National Geographic. And then that was the only image that they, you know, um, want to, um, want to showcase. I mean, you, people could argue that, you know, had the reportage and the images that were, um, published show the struggle of the doctors and nurses, we might have a more balanced, um, um, approach uh, a more balanced, yeah, a, a, a approach towards to, towards the coverage. So um, it's it, it's National Geographic's decision. But how was your feeling? I mean, you already mentioned it. You would have wanted perhaps more images. I would have. I would have wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. But then, of course, um, the on the only uh, um, the, the the only stopper for that was because I, I published this one image. Um, then the, the the hospital only wanted to um, they, they didn't want to have their name uh, mm -hmm. mentioned. They they, um, they specifically also um, asked that that the city where um, where I made the image to to be published. So it was just only um, if we go to the if we go to National Geographic's website, the, the caption is this is a, a picture in in a hospital in Indonesia, and then, mm -hmm. and that's it. That's it. Yeah. Here, uh, this this I think in general. Um, uh, something that is on most furniture journalists' minds, um, the control of the image. You're always yeah. dependent on external elements, publishers, editorial decisions, 
the way the image is framed, almost literally. Um, how can you, if at all, control what happens with your image? Because you have an idea, perhaps even a strong engagement message with a certain photograph. How do you control the life afterwards? Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, Philip John Griffiths once told me, if you believe in the me medium of media, you're lost as a photographer. And what he meant with it, that is the moment you give away your image and it will go its own way. Um, I think we still have that uh, opportunity to mm -hmm. say with our images what we truly uh, uh, meant with it by publishing book or making our exhibitions or having a, a, a good website. But uh, after that, you're lost. And what, what is so significant about uh, Joshua's image, actually, is that his image has been reused over the internet in so many different ways than he uh, than, than the initially uh, uh, content uh, uh, and, and, and caption uh, gave meaning to the image. Uh, so, so the image gets meaning uh, to the uh, context in which it has been used. Mm -hmm. So the moment National Geographic uh, published the image, it gets a cer certain meaning. I think uh, in this uh, this time it was the defining image of the pandemic. But mm -hmm. then when somebody uh, who is um, uh, uh, believe more in the conspiracies of COVID uses this image. It's a proof of the lie, and mm -hmm. and and that's a problem. And I think as a, as a photographer, it's very concerning that we lose control over our images. Mm -hmm. it, it is, isn't it, Joshua? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly the point. Um, I mean, I was going to mention, you know, um, harking back to. Um, here's own work with Baghdad Calling. The, the, the technology of the mobile phone at the, at the beginning, like here said, it was the eve um, of people sending um, images um, throughout um, the Nokia, the old Nokia phone. And, in, and, and that is being um, used then, well, and, and, and a bit now, and now, of course, um, when people are in COVID hospitals and then, and then they uh, um, send images of, of, of their loved ones uh, to, each, to, to each other. But also, 20 years since then, um, right now, the, the smartphone has an additional uh, function with all these yeah. apps and all in Instagram and where you can comment and basically um, destroy the truth, if you like, um, of, of whatever that they are seeing. And then the algorithm um, allows that. So it has, a, it has like an additional function to what the traditional mobile phone, um, uh, how it was used. So I took a little bit of inspiration from from Baghdad calling um, into making into making viral um, in that way. In the end of the nineties, I covered uh, for three years uh, the the pandemic of AIDS in Africa. And uh, when when I published these uh, images, uh, it was intentionally shown at the uh, World AIDS Congress in Durban in South Africa, which then had the government of uh, Tamo Mabeki, and uh, they banned uh, the exhibition there. Um, because um, this reality was too harsh uh, for, for South Africans, they said. And although all the work was made with Zambian activists and Zambian nurses, etc., etc., so really from within, me as a foreigner showing that, you could more or less say as the white man uh, intruding uh, uh, this privacy was not done for them. But uh, at that time, you know, I, I flew to South Africa and I gave a few interviews and I flew back home and um you know that that was more or less uh, it that was the consequence but but to, today two things i think uh, are, are interesting and i wanted to ask you this joshua because first of all i was a foreigner uh, mm -hmm. going there and being able to go back home and 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 secondly there was no uh, social media that would uh, condemn me and, and and make me feel really bad that's exactly one of my questions, Joshua, because you are not a foreigner in Indonesia. You couldn't leave your live in Indonesia within a reality where social media can give all kind of comments, quite harsh sometimes, damaging. Mm -hmm. So what did it do with you? I, I mentioned earlier that, that it got to the point that the, um, the COVID-19 response team tried to hunt down the identity um, of the hospital. And that meant that I have to contact everyone, Breda Photo, uh, National Geographic, to take down anything that is related to my project. So that I have to kind of, you know, um, 
uh, do a block on 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 my digital footprint, so to speak. But then uh, that was also the time when it when it all kind of started uh, when it all became viral that I that I contacted National Geographic. I told them, and this is this is what's happening in Indonesia. And then they said, okay, um, through Disney, they they are um, they're going to, to send security um, over to, to to protect my house 24/7 um, with eight hours uh, shift for the security guard. But mm -hmm. but then of of course um, you know like any millennials today I still live with my parents I mean my parents um, were not happy about it so I had to refuse that um, you know like I didn't want to add fuel to the fire and let just kind of you know slowly die out but that was for me I only recently found out um, that one of my um, colleagues Nimas Laula um, a, a photographer in Bali um, she posted um, on her Insta Instagram story and Twitter about um you know why this image was important and about the um the kind of defamation and um that was done by the indonesian singer and who who believes in this conspiracy theories and such and it got to the point that that she was she was uh, she was threatened by people because some somehow she her address and her phone numbers are are there and and in in in, uh, in the internet and people were threatening her that i'll come to your place and and do all this stuff to you. So she had to, she had to, she had to leave. And it was just insane that that somebody who just defended my work, it's not even her work, had to suffer through this. Perhaps, Josh, it's 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 uh, good to to generalize this a little bit and also shedding light a little bit to to Indonesia. How is it for you to work in in Indonesia, particularly at the moment? Uh, of course, you have the the series, uh, the project on the pandemic, but you're have also a, a, a long-lasting project in West Papua with the ASMAT. Um, how is it for you to work in Indonesia in general? And does, for instance, the project with the ASMAT also have, um, say, certain consequences, touches upon sensitivity, whether it's political or cultural, that has an effect on your work or your professional practice? Um, yes, I think... Uh... I, I think in general, in terms of working in Indonesia, uh, you know, what happened uh, last year was almost like a one-off because it, within two weeks, um, then every, everything went silent. And not, there's nothing else. And and every, and everyone forgets who, who I was, so, so to speak. Yeah. But then, of course, um, whenever you go uh, all around Indonesia, you, there are certain sensitivities that you, that you have to carry with you. Um, Papua, of course. Um, I think um, for for the Asmat work, um, I'm trying to uncover um, you know, the, re the reality in Asmat, the reality what's happening with their cultural practices, um, amongst other things. Um, but then, of course, the uh, the most sensitive part uh, is when you talk about the Papuan independence and, and and all that. Then you know that's when when you're um, hitting uh, murky waters. Um, the, one example would be Veronica Koman, a human human rights lawyer, um, mm -hmm. who, who's who is in exile in Australia, I believe, at the moment, um, for, for 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 voicing this. But then, like, I think my approach with with Papua is just I'm showing facts to facts. The fact is that by 2030, there will be less than 17 percent Papuans in in the land of Papua alone, and then and that is a real um, concern. Mm -hmm. And in 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 Asmat, in in my in my past. Um, uh, you know, documentation. I'm going back there uh, next month. Uh, this time with with a, with a bit of support. Um, you know, we're, we're just showing uh, you know the reality on the ground. This is what the Asmat are facing. I mean, I you know the, I can't speak um, um, too much now, but I mean, uh, you know, I'll 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 find I'll find more um, when when I get back there. Yeah, perhaps to to wrap it up a little bit, also due to the time we have, it's not much. Um, Geert, in general, as a photojournalist, you want to work in as much freedom as you would wish for. Um, it's a huge topic, but um, also in like uh, a crisis situation like the war in Iraq, a uh, lot of photographers, not only in that war but many wars, also went embedded. Um, you went embedded as well with the American army, didn't you? Shortly, uh, yes. Shortly. Um, talking about freedom to do what you want, or perhaps you would uh, be used without your awareness for different reasons, because you were only 
shown what you want to be, what others want you to see. How do you look at this, um, well, difficult situation that the photojournalists might find themselves in uh, doing work in relative freedom? Well, first of all, I think, still believe very much that uh, the photojournalist is part of journalism who is the watchdog of, uh, of democracy. So uh, when I worked in Iraq and I saw that uh, the invasion slash liberation from the American army of Iraq uh, went downhill, um, I wanted to be sure to show that. And in order to do that, I needed an embed with the American army. So in my case, I turned it around. I was not uh, doing propaganda for the American army. I was showing reality on the ground and I needed that embed to be very close because when Americans raided houses and people were beaten up uh, or, or uh, apartments were destroyed and, and, and uh, all men were arrested just uh, on the suspect of being men, mm -hmm. I thought, um, well, if, if, if you want to bring a, a, a domino theory of democracy to the Middle East and this is the way you go about it, uh, it can only go wrong. And yep. later we saw in Abu Ghraib uh, that. And I think in, in terms of this uh, discussion we have here, is uh, journalism still the watchdog of democracy or is social media, do we let that happen, the watchdog of journalism? It's a good question. Perhaps your last words just to come on comment on this photojournalism uh, or journalism in in general watchdog of democracy um i i'd like to finish maybe uh, you know so the magnum photographer susan micellas once said that an event doesn't exist in our world unless one of us happens to be there mm -hmm. um, i think that's important to remember you know, you know people can say that photo photojournalism is dead but as a matter of fact responsible visual journalism um, happens to be one of our most reliable sources of information you know for example during the pandemic or in in here's case uh, during the iraq war perhaps our economic models and perceptions and representations may can change but it, it really doesn't change one of the tenets of photojournalism that we need someone to, to be there to see and to record it great i think this is a perfect way to end this for us morning conversation for you somewhere in late morning or afternoon uh, thank you Geert van Kesteren thank you Joshua Erwandi and also thank you Ayu Utami who opened this uh, artist in conversation focusing on photojournalism and particularly focusing on Indonesia thank you all for your contribution and your participation and uh, thank you all viewers and listeners for being here. Take good care on the program of Dutch culture and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.